This podcast is part of the Everyday Heroes Podcast Network, the network for first responders and those who support them. Hello, my friend. Welcome to the Hero Academy Podcast. I created this podcast for you if you are a first responder, police officer, fireman, nurse, military personnel. This podcast is for you. Let's get your stories out. They need to be heard by everyone, especially the good ones. Let's share those stories and create some positivity out there in the world. Enjoy this episode. All right. So this week's episode of the Hero Academy podcast, we have Robert Ledegar, who was part of the U.S. Marshals. What was your uh, role as in the U.S. Marshals? I was a supervisor with um, within the Warren Squad, the uh, Fugitive Investigative Unit, where we were part of the, <clears throat> the New York, New Jersey Regional Fugitive Task Force out of I was in New York, so I was at a Eastern District and also in uh, Central Islip. Okay, all right. Uh, my neck of the woods. And yeah. uh, how long were you in that task force? Uh, since it started, I spent majority of my career, 20 good years in Warren's Fugitive Investigations, and I did um, almost 25 years with the Marshals in general. Wow, that's a long, yeah. long time. yeah. Yeah. Do you have any uh, favorite cases that you worked on? Oh, there's there are so many. You, know, you go backwards, man. I remember when I was um, new to working out in in Long Island, and I brought a case out there, and the the perp was wanted uh, in South Carolina, or North North Carolina or South Carolina, and I think in like Illinois. He had two Fed warrants on him, and he was um, released in error. Okay, it um, happens. It happens, and it you know it just but it was a huge case. He was wanted by the FBI also, and for bank robbery, and we tracked him down to a house in Brentwood, and he was in a, a basement apartment with his sister. And a violent, violent guy, and we we located him and made entry throughout the whole house. You know, not knowing exactly where he was in there, but we we pushed him into um, a bathroom in the basement apartment, and um, we got into a shooting with him. Oh shit. And, you know, and every you know, it's not nothing like the movies at all. You know, and he had a um, a, I think a thirty-two or a thirty-eight, and um, you know, it was it was garbage. It was taped together, and um, I was behind my partner who was a Nassau County Sheriff Sergeant, big guy, monster guy, and uh, he had an M four. And uh, the perp shot at us and he returned fire and shot him. But you're in a, you know, we were in a a basement apartment, an illegal apartment, you know. Yeah. And um, you're like, how did we even make it out of there? And, you know, that was that was one of four shootings I was involved in, but out in Long Island. And wow, four shootings. Four shootings in my career. I mean, I'm in the, I work one of the most dangerous jobs in in law enforcement. I mean, every job in law enforcement is dangerous. I don't want to take that away from anybody. No, but the people you're going after, they know that they're looking at serious time if they get caught and they, they don't want to get caught. Yeah. I mean, we're coming to get you and uh, you're going to jail. That's it. And yeah, nobody, who, you don't want to go to jail. It's, it's horrible. Um, so yeah, I was, I was involved in four shootings myself as, and as a supervisor, to include those four shootings, there was three or four more that the the men and women that worked for me were involved in. So it, it, it it's a lot. It's a lot on you. And um, you know, then the, then to be in, involved in shootings with the men and women you work with, and and they're younger than you at that state at this stage of the game. You know, I'm a, I'm a supervisor, and we had one shooting in in Queens. And at the during a shootout, where we're in another illegal apartment, and you could, I, I, I make myself like the door frame. You're, you, you, you can, you shrink your body somehow. You know, you, you get, 
and you're scared. That's what nobody right. realizes. Like you're scared. It, it's it's the feeling, the, sh- the stress, fear, anxiety, everything going in at once, the adrenaline. And I remember looking and it looked like she was miles away, but she was right next to me, this other young lady who worked for me. We're both in the doorway and we're like, you, we couldn't return fire because there were six marshals in front of me that were in the shootout in the, this apartment. And our my guys returned fire and, and hit the man, the perp. And um, at the end of it all, the young lady that was there, the marshal, the next day she found out she was pregnant. Oh my God. Now, and I'm... You know, I don't know, I'm like 10, 15 years older than her. And when you get older, like we get to, you know, you start accepting things or truly understanding things. And uh, the the feeling that ca- that came over me, knowing that, finding out that she was pregnant. And I'm like, what, what, what have I done? You know, if it went bad. Right. And that, and people don't get that. And those are some of the things out there, you know, that did you ever, um, seek any professional help, like speak to a therapist to try and, um, talk about some of these shootings? No. And you know, what's so, what's so horrible is that the, the agency, when I was working, they never focused on it. I think today it might've been, might be getting better where guys and guys and girls are getting better counseling after it. But, you know, for me, it's like we were involved in shootings and you had to go back to the office and write a report and sit down. And again, listen, we federal agents, we have no union. We have no guidance or, you know, a, a structured path on what we're doing. We're just, we're learning as we go. And like, it's never was put down and, and you want to rely on your, your headquarters, you know, these these so-called leaders that, you know, foolishly get promoted compared to like our 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 district leaders. Like I remember my my chiefs like, no, go home and go to bed. Go get some sleep, you know, go get some food, clean up, take a shower, you know, and come back tomorrow. But then you still get somebody in the chain of command who is worried about their own self. And they're like, no, you have to write up what happened. They're like, I, I still can't figure out what happened. We had a couple of guys that have to go to the hospital because of the, the tinnitus in their ears. It's just, it's insane, you know, or actually getting hurt in the house, falling down, you know, or anything, you know. And then, Post-traumatic, and stre- post-traumatic just, stress alone. That alone, yeah. And, you know, to this day, it, it's someone like you brings it up like, oh, my my goodness, four shootings that you personally were involved in, you know, in your career. It's, it's, it's a huge number. It's huge. And still today, I, you know, I'm a Navy veteran, so I'm very grateful to the VA, you know, to go and get my physicals and talk and find out. But yeah, I, I've been diagnosed with PTSD, you know, from my, my military service. And then here as a U.S. Marshal. I, I, I've heard of better help where you don't have to go anywhere. You can do telehealth appointments. Um, that might be something that you, I, I recommended it to my son also. Um, just look into it. Yeah, I definitely will. Definitely. Yeah. Better, better help. Um, cause I see that you served in desert storm also. Yeah, I did. Um, the before, during, and after, I was there for 14 months. I turned 21 in Saudi Arabia. Oh no, and no God. beer. And no beer. <laughs> what were you, what uh, unit were you, what were you doing there? I was with um, a security unit that was stationed in, we were out of Bahrain. And um, <clears throat> I worked investigations there. I was... Um, in the Navy, they call them master at arms, which is military police. Yep. And uh, I worked in what, you know, the, the acronyms are the best, you know. Uh, it was, I worked security investigations, which they called CID, which was, you know, criminal investigation division. 
and we fell under NIS, which is the Navy Investigative Service, which now today they call it NCIS. Right. The Navy Criminal Investigative Service. So, but that was back in the day, you know, in 91, 1991. So I can't even watch NCIS because of the things that they do. It's like, it makes no sense. The, like they have no jurisdiction <laughs> and they're investigating things like in the middle of the city that have nothing to do with the Navy. Nothing at all, but it's been on for 20 years and everybody, now they're making all these new episodes. And I was fortunate as a marshal to work with NIS out of Virginia. They had to come to New York because there was a, um, an international um, marriage scam going on and Navy sailors were marrying women from with ties to Russia okay and it was all like the Russian it was huge and it was early in my career but we had like six six or seven targets we had to go after and it was all mainly in Brooklyn of course and I had to call in all different teams to come do this. And uh, the funny thing is that, you know, we have pictures of these women and some of them were pretty, you know, very good looking, but they're all <laughs> dressed, you know, in lingerie and that. So, of course, all the guys are like, oh, I'll definitely be available for the hit for this <laughs> one. And, uh, but we had to do it, you know, and it was actually, I think it was actually filmed. I think we had a news crew with us because it was such a big case and there was, you know, targets everywhere. And I remember that NIS agent or NCIS agent and an ICE agent came up from Virginia, nice people. And they were just, you know, blown away by the work, you know, tactics of us in New York, you know, when you have you have U.S. Marshals and NYPD and Suffolk PD and Nassau PD, New York Corrections, State Police, all working together, you know, going, doing all these different hits. And uh, it was very successful. We arrested, you know, the, the six or seven targets and a couple of other people that, you know, were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. What kind of scam were they were they not marrying the women or were they actually marrying the women? They were they were marrying the women and having them come to the country, but it was a, a scam marriage so they can get their their stat their US status to be here. Right. And so, they're probably getting paid for it as well. They're getting paid good. Yeah. The Navy guys were getting, you know, thousands of dollars. And now you're, you know, whatever the the scams were, I forget what it was, but the women are coming over and they're prostitutes, you know, so they're, yeah. they're conducting business over here with uh, the Russian mob at a, and a lot of it was in Brooklyn and Brighton beach. Wow. Can't turn a hole into a housewife. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, it, and then you also worked on uh, something with Saddam Hussein. No, I, I, in, in the Navy. Yeah. Or in the U S in the U S marshals. No, you, we get, we get a little confused. The marshals I dealt with um, El Chapo when he came. El Chapo, El Chapo. That's it. I, yeah. I'm confusing. I'm confusing. Uh, I, I read the trial of El Chapo and then I was confusing that with uh desert storm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's I've I've experienced some some amazing. You know who I'm thinking of? You know who I'm thinking of? The guy that just took over for the UFC. Um, he was an FBI supervisor, and he trained. You got you got to look him up. The guy's pretty impressive. He trains in no gi jujitsu. He um. He interrogated Saddam Hussein. Really? Yeah, I just heard that earlier today. That's why I have Hussein on the brain. <laughs> so what was your role with El Chapo? 
El Chapo was out of Eastern New York. It was a, a Long Island case with the, the DEA out of Long Island. Awesome guys. Awesome. They did an unbelievable job. And um, the warrant was turned over to the Marshal Service, which comes to me. And it, it was me and a couple other guys that were assigned to it, working with those guys. And um, we worked on the the actual parts of getting information for the arrest. And then when he was captured and arrested, the extradition coming over here, transportation and the trial out of Brooklyn. So we, I was involved in it all the time, every day. And, uh, you know, it's history. That's the, you know, for, for guys like you and I, that in our careers, that's, um, that's the biggest criminal. We, we, Came, yeah, lifetime. Came, yeah. Came, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. historic, you know. Did you watch Narcos at all? You watch it? You're not a big TV guy, are you? Nah, not at all. My wife, my wife watched it and uh, she would be uh, stunned at, at times when she heard certain names because she would hear me at home talking on the phone to some of the guys about stuff because work doesn't stop and it always happens after hours. And so, now that you know you get retired and you're watching these these silly Netflix shows, she's watching it all and she's like blown away that she I heard, heard you. I heard you mention that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, man, El Chapo. Now, when you were transporting, was there ever a time where you got like information where like it was like okay, you have to be really careful here? Well, what we had done is um. My chief back in the district there, they court, they ran everything and organized everything. And we had our, the Marshall's special operations group come into town and they did the transportation to and from the, the jail that was in um, Manhattan. Because that's we, his best opportunity to break out. That's, that's what movies are made of. Ah, exactly. And then we had NYPD, aviation, harbor patrol, because we had to cross the Brooklyn Bridge. And then we also had state police and then everybody else that wanted to get in on it, you know, but the, we had great, you know, he had every Intel, every law enforcement Intel person working on this. So yeah, we got some, some chatter that was on social media, but there's no, there's nobody or no people or groups that are going to be successful to attack us, the marshals, and the, all the other law enforcement to break this guy out during that tran during that transport. You know, it's never going to happen. Never. How many and times was he transported back and forth like that with that big of an escort? Oh uh, well, but we would, you know, you'd have to manipulate, you know, the media on what we're doing. So we we kept him in the courthouse a, a few nights when they thought we were bringing him back, and okay, we would just we the security in and out of the courthouse was insane. Like it was yep. a fortress. You're not, yep. you know, and it's yeah. crazy in New York. Look at in Brooklyn too, just that. The courthouse sat, you know, it's very attackable. I mean, we're right underneath the Brooklyn Bridge and underneath the courthouse is the train system. Yeah. And it's new. like, come on, you're in New York and you know, you lights and sirens don't mean anything. You know, that's that's why I said that's that was their best opportunity to try and break them out. Um, but they're not going to try and go against all of those agencies, like you said. But I, I, I could see them making a movie about it. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. I mean, we there was some chatter on there that, you know, somebody they're going to break them out for a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. But it's never it never came true. Um, the 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 most excitement. We had is that somebody showed up at the courthouse to get into the courtroom and he made it through. <clears throat> and when he was in the courtroom, he started saying that he was related to El Chapo. And we're like, who how did you this? get in here? And who is this nut? And how did you get through 40 layers of security, you know? Yeah. You know, then we had to push him into a room and every, we were just, everybody was stunned and people were making phone calls of who this guy was. And he was, he was disturbed. And um, it was, I was told, and I went upstairs 
with a couple of the guys I work with, and he was in a, a, a neighboring courtroom. We were like, that's it. Let's go. You're under arrest. You know, we'll we'll make up something as we get down the stairs. But you know, you you you're not yeah, supposed to be he here. He definitely passed through some checkpoints that he wasn't <laughs> supposed to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but you wonder how does one get through something? You know what it is? A group of a dozen people, dozen two dozen, they're not getting through. But right. one one person meandering through, one person's distracted, looking looking another way. One person can get through. Yeah. And if you just follow the, the sequence of what's going on, like, oh, you got to go through this metal detector, or you just start putting your personal items in a bin and you keep going to the next level, you pat once you pass the first level and you're up there, yep. they're just walking you through now. Yep. And it's um, that's what happens. After uh Chapo, was there any other like Cases that got your juices flowing, like really exciting ones. Oh my goodness, yeah, it, it's every day in this in this business, especially for us in in New York. I mean, every day something's going on, and and the men and women I worked with, they were they had some of the biggest cases in the world. What I mean, was uh, some of what was some of your favorites highlights? Well, my well for me, it was just a, I think it was in 2019. We. We were doing due diligence. It was just me and my one of my analysts who was from the army and like assigned to us. And we had a teletype that our guy we were looking for, his FBI number was hitting on an arrest in Bridgeport, Connecticut, but the name and date of birth didn't match. So now he had gotten, he had a traffic stop and they took him in and Bridgeport police fingerprint them, do everything. And they look and it's like, oh, it's a different guy. There must be an error somewhere. And they let him go. So my analyst tracks it down and does a little bit more research. And it's it just, just these things just happen. And he's like, oh, I know a Lieutenant in Bridgeport in my army reserve unit calls up there. He's like, hey, who is this guy who got arrested the other night? And it's like, oh, this guy, he goes, can you send me a picture? And he does. And we were like, holy shit. That was the U.S. Marshal's top 15. Wow. One of the most wanted. His name is Andre Neverson. Wanted in Brooklyn for a double homicide. He had killed his girlfriend and his sister. Been on a run for about 10 or 12 years. And, and we, he's just been giving false names and false date of births the entire time. The whole time. And when he, when he did that crime, he was a big guy, a huge bodybuilder, worked at a bouncer at a bar. And we had thought all the all the intel was that he left the States and went somewhere into the Caribbeans. And the case was stepped on. So many people had worked it. And for this to pop up, and they send us a picture and it looked nothing like him. He lost like 150 pounds and he was just skin and bone. But you can't change the face, you know, the 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 look, the eyes. Right. We were like, holy shit, that's the guy. And they're like, hey, his girlfriend just came to pick up the car that was impounded. Here's the address. Here's where he lives. So we made a phone call to Bridgeport and um, I told the deputy, I go, I'm, I'm going to make your career right here, man. I'm going to give you a top 15, put it right in the palm of your hand. And I did. And uh, we just went back and forth with the intel. He, he went to the house and he was calling me, sending me a live video of our guy sitting on the front porch of his house. And the marshal was with another guy and he goes, hey, we're just calling for backup. This guy's a major player. We're just waiting for more people. You know, it's yeah. it's Tuesday at one o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah. No problem. He, I go, take your time. As long as you have eyes on him, I'm confident. And um, I had gone into to tell my chief that we're going to arrest the top 15. And he was like, no way. I'm like, oh, yeah, way. And when I was telling him, he was briefing some other people 
on El Chapo, the trial that's starting. So he's just smiling. I walk out and about a half hour later, I come in. I'm like, one under, you know, we arrested El Chapo. I mean, uh, Andre Nevison on top of having El Chapo. So those two major cases, our my district, East of New York, was awarded district of the year one of the eighth largest district in the nation for doing work like that and other, you know, duties that, that pertain that year. Yeah. That's that awesome. Huge. That was huge. It was great. Who's this guy, uh, Thomas Quails. That was a Ponzi scammer. Yeah, that was, that was before I became a supervisor. I was given that, that case. At, Cause an a assistant U S attorney who I became worked with and became friendly with, um requested me to work it because he knew who I was and that I would get the guy. And he was a Ponzi schemer and he stole well over $25 million. Wow. And um probably more, but that's what I've known of. And he they let him out on bail. Why would you let you know? <laughs> and he fled the country and um we you can never use your don't use your laptop or your cell phone you know stop I mean, thinking that's, that's obvious you can't use any any electronics nothing and you're always going to call your mom and dad and this a girlfriend always and we were monitoring the parents calls and his other family and we were able to track him down into to Montreal Canada and um, it was on St. Patty's Day. And we get an alert that he went live on his phone, that it was happening. He was making calls. And it was him or his girlfriend who was up there with him. And they kept the phone on. And we were able to hit it and track it down. Yep. And, you know, we work with the Canadians, you know, and you know, within a couple of hours, they found him in a Subway restaurant, like the Subway um, fast food chain places, sitting there with his laptop open and a cell phone on. And they grabbed awesome. everything for us. What an idiot. <laughs> so um, I worked anything from, I mean, look at my career. There is no, it's not as, as structured as, as police departments, like you work, you know, in the precincts, you're a precinct detective. And then, you know, you have the specialty units, like there's homicide or robbery, right. you know, in the marshal service, it's, you know, it's a bag of stuff, you know, it's, it it's, you're, there's no specialty that you do, you know, when you're a fugitive investigator, you're going after the, the, the fugitive, the person, you know, so it didn't, it was anything from a Ponzi schemer to double homicide. Now, for for homicide guys, would you guys travel out of the country? Like, would you go down to the Caribbean, pick yeah. people up? Yeah. Yeah. As long as there's an extradition treaty with everybody, yes. And we work we work hand in hand with um, the local police, with NYPD and Suffolk PD and Nassau PD, and we we take you know they turn cases over to us, but we we maintain a partnership and a relationship, you know, and like. We'll call the detectives and the guys or girls that have that case, that is their case. Like, hey, we're going to go hit a house tomorrow. Do you want to meet us? Come with us. And they're like, yeah, we want to come, you know, yeah. and, it. and go from there. I had um, the marshals pick up a couple of guys that were wanted for some sex crimes when I was in special victims. Um, guys that had gone down to Texas or, you know, I had to do prevent departure letters uh, what countries haven't you been to or like what countries did you know somebody was in, but they didn't have extradition with the U S well, you have Cuba, Venezuela, you know, you, there, we know there's people down there and you can't get them, you know, and it, it's disappointing that the locals don't push them out, you know, for that, but it happens. I mean, I worked one case with a, a lady and it was a parental kidnapping case and 
she took her daughter, the, the, the daughter's father was in France, she took her from France and was here in, of course, in, in New York and out in Long Island in Massapequa. And um, the father had petitioned the court that the mother didn't return the child back to France. And it, it's called the Hague Act and it's parental international parental kidnapping case. Mm. And it's horrible. It's sad. It's a real, it's yep. real horrible. And, um, but the mother wasn't the best of peoples. Um, she was involved in porn. She was in playboy. She was a playboy model, amazing looking woman. Um, she was a DJ. She was all over the place, but now you have your, I, I think she was eight or nine year old daughter involved in this in there it's there yeah. and um we we got the case and we had to work it up real quick and because she she tried to leave the next day and we got her at jfk she was going to fly from jfk to canada from canada to japan or somewhere but she was making her way to vietnam and if she would have got to vietnam it would have been over because we don't have an extradition treaty with them. And then that little girl would have been destroyed. So we, we caught her with the help of the guys at, at JFK. And uh, that afternoon, after arguing with the courts, thank goodness the father was in the States. But that afternoon, we were able to turn the daughter over to the father. Instead, the courts wanted us to turn her over to CPS in Brooklyn. I'm like, are you out of your mind? This little girl's from France. You don't speak hardly any English. Wow. And then, you know, so thank goodness the international courts got involved and they overrode what the local judge said. And we were, they were like, no, turn them over, turn her over the, to the father. But that, that was a great thing too. But then here I am, you know, I'm a supervisor and I, we have to babysit this little girl. And thank goodness I had two or three women that work with me for me and they were moms. So it was like, Oh, this is a lot of pressure off me. And they're like, here you go. You know, I mean, we had to go out and buy coloring books and video games and everything. That's the good stuff. Yeah. And I, I, uh, I normally don't like to go to the dark side, but your story is so incredibly powerful that you know we have to talk about how your career ended um it wasn't the way you wanted it to end and it ended under a tremendous amount of stress i, I didn't know about the four shootings my yeah. god yeah and then I, and and then the five years of just aggravation yeah i'm i'm going to let you tell the story well it was it's five years of hell and stress five years of hell yeah you know, and I'm not a fan of internal affairs, never, ever was, you know, it's different, different types of cops, I think. Um, so what I did is, you know, there was a, a young lady in the, the task force who worked for me, who was being, um, who was really, in the beginning was being bullied and, and, you know, and she was one of those, one of the girls that could get along with everybody, you know, she had thick skin, but then it just started raising, rising up, you know, when she was being sexually harassed and at one point what types, what types of sexual harassment um well she's she's a lesbian okay so the guys would make fun of her or degrade her about being with another woman and inquire or question her about like what it's like to do all these different sex acts with on a woman you know they want you know disgusting talking points very it. inappropriate yeah very inappropriate very inappropriate especially from grown men who are married some with daughters yep you know and this is what you're doing and it's not about being in a police squad room or being in a locker room you don't do it you know you just after a while you don't do it and things can't things got back to me of what was happening and it was even one one of the one of the guys would make her kiss him hello every morning and then when he would walk up behind her and rub up against her and make you know yep 
comments to her and then touch her. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So it comes to me and it explodes. It explodes to what you can't imagine. So I defend it, the young lady. I defend her today. And she was right. She was right since day one. And um, I went up against the guys that I had worked with. I called them all out, went to internal affairs. The investigations got stepped on. They got pulled. Different reports were written. And four or five or six of these guys actually started to personally attack me. And they did everything you could possibly think of from saying that I was a bad person, a bad supervisor. I was a racist. I was a drug dealer. I stole money. I cheated on my wife. Everything just threw it all out there. And that just disrupted the whole internal investigation because they lost focus on the girl's complaints and just targeted me because now I'm being accused of committing crimes, legit, right. major crimes. So that, and then the system just works slow, but here I am still working and going and going and going. Well, it gets to you. It starts eating you up and beats you up. And there's moments when you just, you give in. And, and I did, I had one of those moments and I, I had an opportunity, so say it, that I came across the number two guy of my agency and we were in a room together and I confronted him about what was happening to me. And it wasn't a, a professional talk. Okay. It, you know, emotional words be being said. Well, he had a lot of power and he emboldened internal affairs to come after me. And I like using the word that the government used, like fishing expedition. Like they went on a fishing expedition to come after me. I'm a nobody. But the men who degraded this girl and assaulted her and bullied her, they had the backing of headquarters, and I didn't. So they drummed up these administrative now charges against me for violating the code of professional responsibility. Disregard all the, the criminal accusations that were made that there was no evidence on. They felt, one person felt, speculated that I should have been more forthcoming during my interviews with internal affairs. And because of that, she found that I lacked candor, that I lied during my internal affairs. What was so strange is the chief investigator from internal affairs at the end of my interviews stated on the record, thank you for your candor and bringing that to our attention. But she didn't see it that way. But she was part of the problem. She was one of them. And she put down that I can't be rehabilitated. I don't perform at a successful level to continue forward with the marshal service. But it was so strange because the last 20 years I performed at an outstanding level and I've been promoted and recommended for promotions. So during the during the the full outbreak of the pandemic, and I was about to retire, and I had two months and I was terminated. I was fired for conduct unbecoming. Wow. And I lost, I lost everything. I lost 32 years of service. I lost my pension, my retirement, my medical benefits, everything. Just with a stroke of a pen, gone. And what do you do? You know, I was up against it. And um, I had no union. I have to have my own lawyers. It's expensive. Thank goodness the National Police Defense Foundation, they believed me and helped me. And um, I went on for a couple of years and my case is under appeal with the Merit System Protection Board so that I can get my my martial retirement, get back pay and attorney fees. But while that was all going on, I was able to connect with some really great people, smart people who helped me. And I did a lot of reading and research and I educated myself and with the help of the Office of Professional Management, I was able to retire. I was able to get my full 32 years calculated correctly. And I was able to get my full pension 
and medical benefits. Um, but I still have my appeal for the other stuff that's out there. Um, but that right was, now you still have that? I still have it. It's still sitting before this the Merit System Protection Board. It's a quorum. And they're so backed up. There's thousands of cases. And there's not that many cases like mine. But I was identified and labeled as a whistleblower mm. for telling telling the truth to defend this young lady who was being, you know, attacked at work by a couple of guys. And it could have been handled so much better than what it was handled. And it got so bad is that a lot of people retired early. They got out of there because they knew where it was going. And the supervisor of that task force, he had lied. He he was covering up a lot of things. And he was, they were going to fire him. They proposed to terminate him. But when he went before what we call the deciding official in the marshals, the same person I went before, she let him retire because they were all of a headquarters status. That's what we all, you know, there's a conspiracy theory, look at it, but why wouldn't you let me retire? I committed no crimes. You knew I was being harassed, but because I called them out and I told the truth and I said what it was and people know it's all true. And we all know it's true hundred percent because a couple of years ago, the young lady, she retired. Well, the marshal service settled an EEO complaint by her and she got money and a promotion and they were hands off. So she was telling the truth. Yep. But you all came after me as if I was the problem. I told you before we started recording, I had a supervisor who told a similar story of defending a woman from sexual harassment and both she and he were transferred from the unit they were in. And uh, I won't say any names, obviously, but uh, he, he landed on his feet eventually. But both of them were transferred from the unit and the offenders were allowed to remain in the unit. It's amazing because they did the same thing with us. They We removed her from the, the task force itself, but they kept those some people in the task force. And our leaders from headquarters forced and ordered us all to work together. When you have these, they make the policies to separate everybody. Yep. But they didn't want to do that. You're like, what? where are we getting something wrong here? And why are the, the leaders from headquarters, which is in Virginia, not listening to your counterparts who are leaders and managers in New York? When... When my chief and the chief of the task force were on the same page, they were like, we got to separate everybody here. Right. If you got to remove people, we'll remove them. But they were being told, no, put everybody back in the same office. You're like, it's insane how bad it is. And it happens a lot of places and you don't believe it does. And I, I say it, I guess, jokingly, like, this is New York. This doesn't happen in New York. Maybe if it was in Oklahoma, yeah. But where we are, there's too much going on. But it's it happens everywhere, every day, Can, still today. And it's sad. So when does uh when does all of this go into the book? Uh, I'm hoping it's going, it's in the book. And it it, it it it's hoping for the book to come out in November, November now, which has been a great therapy for me is to write it all down speak with a writer who she's doing a phenomenal job and um put it on paper you know because i get everybody that tells me you should do this you should do that you should do you know, all these experts but never been involved in something like this or been in my position and to yep. do all the things that people tell you to do it takes a lot of money and I have a, you know, a lot of things to do here. I've, I have a, a family to take care of, to provide for, to protect. And that was the most important thing that I had to do. And I do still do today. And I have the more support from my wife than I could ever believe I would get. You my, moved out of New York, right? 
we moved out of New York because there were some bad things happening to us from some of these guys out who were out in Long Island. And they were, you know, why? I I mean, there's parts of, of what happened that would resemble the movie Copland with Sylvester Stallone. I mean, what some of these guys were doing to, to me and my wife and to my house and to our cars and to my neighborhood. What you're sitting outside my house, just disrupting things, scaring, intimidation. Yep. So, and those guys, most, a lot of them retired. Some just transferred out because they were younger. Some are still working. It but, makes you wonder how some of these people pass a psych exam. It's like, it, it's almost as if a psych exam is all BS. <laughs> they totally are. And, but what's really, what's so disturbing is my wife says it better and she said it. And that she's like, how could these men are married and have daughters? How could you do that? And then for my own, it's a very, it's emotional and it's it's a proud feeling that comes over me is when I've had I've had some very strong women tell me to like, thank God Bobby Lediger is in my life because of what you did. And it's a great, it's what a beautiful thing to say to me. But what it did to me, doing, you know, doing everybody's like, you did the right thing. You did your job. You you're a real leader. You did what a supervisor is supposed to do. And I'm like, I I, I go back to old school, old ways. I was raised my mom and dad, and I have a little sister. And my dad said, if anybody messes with your sister, you better beat the shit out of them. And that, that she's, you messed with like my sister, a girl who worked for me or worked with me. Yep. And she, she asked for help. And some of you guys, she looked up to. And this is what you did and how they can continue on today. So, I don't regret what I did. I regret so much of what happened to me and my wife and to the girl and to so many other people. Because when my agency went after me, they went after everybody that's connected to me. And it was it's really sad. That's why I have a real bad taste for internal affairs and agency lawyers, because they towed a company line, whatever. They're afraid of people with titles and positions and I think that's what makes us different working in New York. You're not afraid. <laughs> so what's the plan for the next decade, the next 10 years of uh, earning, earning potential, your life, how you're going to live it? What's, what's the, uh, what's the transition? What's the shift? Well, thank goodness we're doing really good and I'm retired, but am I, my pension coming in and we moved down to Florida we have a beautiful house. My wife works from home. And, uh, you know, we do some great things. We, we, we're we back to enjoying our lives. We had miserable, miserable time for a few years. Um, we'll do some traveling. We, uh, you know, get back into boating again. Okay. And, uh, you know, and working. I work, I travel. I do work as a security consultant for a private organization. And uh, that's great. They they treat me real well. Um, and I, you know, I know next year we're going to Italy for two weeks. That's uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. That I want to go to uh, Australia bef before before uh, maybe for my fiftieth. Ah, you got to do it. It's only a it's only a bill. That's yeah. All it's only and it's only uh it's only two days of travel. <laughs> <laughs> that, you got you to gotta get that out of your mind. That's <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth it. I, I but it, like from the northeast, it's the furthest place we can travel. Of course, and okay. even from the east, even down in Florida, like you have to go first. You got to go west, maybe stop in California or Hawaii, and then you got to go south, south and west, further yeah. west. It's like it's literally the other side of the world. Yeah, yeah. That I fly in is the worst. <laughs> it's so annoying to travel. But I imagine, I imagine it was even more. Some some guys that have uh, traveled with air marshals have said that it's a pain in the butt. Oh, it's got to be. I mean, I lose. I I get so un frustrated and uncomfortable when I go back up to New York, and it's only two and a half hours. 
you know, and you're like, it's it's frustrating. It, it it's so frustrating. It's boring, and you always get on there and they're like, oh, the Wi-Fi doesn't work, or the 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 TV doesn't work in the plane. And you're like, how is why? The simplest thing you got to keep going, and they it gets broken. <laughs> Rob, I really uh, appreciate you coming on, and I'm I'm really looking forward to reading that book. I can't wait to get my hands on a copy of it. Uh, you got the title set? Yeah, but I'm, I can't tell you. You can't tell me. Okay, all right, I'm no problem. <laughs> no problem. We'll, we'll do we'll do an updated episode. I think uh, I'll fly down to Florida, <laughs> and uh, we'll do an in person episode. All right. For sure. I I mean the pool's waiting for you. No problem. All right. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate you. Dave, thank you very much, man. Thank you. All right. All right, family. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Everyone I interview, I've chosen for you guys because of this story. And I hope that you get some value every single time. If you did get value or just just simply enjoyed the episode, please share the episode with someone that you know. If you know of a guest, a frontline hero that has an amazing story, something uplifting or a positive message, hit me up in the contact form of www.davidleith.com or DM me at Instagram at davidleith, the number one. Subscribe to the show because I have some really phenomenal guests coming up in the next few weeks that you definitely don't want to miss. All right, one.